Here we're dealt ace 10 suited in the small blind, the straddles on, under the gun plus one raises to 120. The hijack calls, I call, the under the gun straddler calls, we're going four ways to the flop. It's 10 7 4 with two diamonds and a heart. We have top top and a backdoor flush draw. I check, the under the gun player checks, the early position raiser also checks. This is a really important aspect because it means he probably won't have anything too strong, otherwise he would have bet to avoid giving three other players a chance to see a free card while some draws are out there. If the hijack is last to act, he bets 280. I consider check raising, and said I call. Under the gun folds right away. Under the gun plus one calls, which I find really interesting after he checked initially. He probably only has a one pair hand at best. He could have a flush draw or something like two overs with backdoor draws. Three of us make it to the turn, it's the three of clubs, a blank, other than the fact that 6-5 is a straight. All of us check. This indicates that the hijack isn't very strong and won't have two pair or better. Ace-10 will often be the best hand. The river is the seven of diamonds, the flush draw gets there and the board pairs. I don't like seeing it still, we could have the winner. I put out a small bet of 500 in an attempt to get the showdown cheaply. On rare occasions, I'll do this with something close to the nuts as well. I said earlier that I didn't think under the gun plus one would be all that strong after check calling the flop bet as the pre-flop raiser, yet here he is raising me on the river to 2160, he'll never have a full house in this spot because he would have either bet the flop himself or at least check raise with a set after the hijack bet and I called. Also, I have a 10 making it even less likely that the opponent has a full house. The best hand under the gun plus one will have is a flush, some of the time I'd expect him to bet diamond draws on the flop as well. so. Maybe he's just turning something like ace-king offsuit with the ace of diamonds into a bluff after seeing my blocker bet. The hijack folds. I contemplate flatting because I'm not buying while under the gun plus one is selling. The problem is that there's a moderate chance that the opponent has what he's representing, which is a flush. I can still have flushes, and I can have full houses or even quads. If I had pocket tens or another set, I might have played it the same way with just a call on the flop and the last player to act bets. Under the gun plus one only has 4,800 total. I don't see how he can call a shove with almost anything that he played this way because a 3-bet jam looks incredibly strong and there's only one combo of pocket 10s available for him to have. I go with my gut and I announce that I'm all in for 4800 effective to one of the gutsiest plays that I've ever made. I'm not advocating that anyone else do this, I've turned a hand that has plenty of value into a bluff. It's not entirely necessary but it's something that I don't mind doing when I put my opponents on a capped range and I have good removal. You saw me bluff shove earlier in the 5-10 game with King-Queen and it didn't work out. If it doesn't work out here, I'll have gotten destroyed today for one of my biggest losses ever. As the opponent is tanking longer and longer, it's becoming more likely that he didn't raise my river bet as a bluff. After 45 seconds, the player eventually folds. Our assessment of the situation pays off. We get a massive 3-bet river shove through to take down an enormous pot when the opponent didn't have to call too much more to get to showdown. Our story was convincing enough. This feels amazing to win. It's one of my absolute favorite hands that I've ever played. A half hour goes by when we pick up ace 10 of diamonds on the button. The game isn't great. But we've got a nice hand in good position. I raised to 30. There's a new pro that took the previous opponent's seat. He calls in the small blind. We're heads up in position. The flop comes king 8 6 all diamonds. We flop the nuts. We're getting hit with the deck today. The small blind checks. We could check or bet small. I don't like missing opportunities to build pots when we have strong hands. I bet 20. It's a tiny sizing. The opponent is okay with it. He makes the call to see what will develop on future streets. The turn is the eight of clubs pairing the board. The small blind doesn't care that we were the preflop aggressor and have a huge hand. He's going to wrap trips or better as he leads for 50. I wasn't expecting for him to bet out like that. There's a chance that we could be beat and a chance that he could be bluffing. In either case, there's no sense in raising. I call hoping for a blank on the river. The dealer puts out the ten of clubs. It isn't too concerning if we were ahead on the turn. The small blind is going to continue with the story that he has a strong hand. He bet to 140. He's taken a strange line. My first instinct is to raise because we definitely have a good enough hand to justify doing that. But I don't want to potentially get re-raised by a full house because that's somewhat what the small blind is representing after leading turn and firing again on the river for a larger sizing. The opponent is bluffing. He won't be able to call a raise anyway. I call the 140. The small blind doesn't show. He flicks his cards in face down. It looks like he tried to bluff us and chose a bad time to do so. It's been an interesting session today. We had to make a big fold earlier with aces, but we've done well to get in the green again. We're up 900. In this one, we've got ace 10 suited in the under the gun straddle. A player in middle position makes a big raise to 50. He's shown some hands down that were pretty out of line. 
Small blind calls, this is JR, the opponent who gave us the dinner for two, he just rebought for a small amount. I call for 40 more to close the action. Three of us are still in contention. The flop comes 9-7-4 with two spades. We've got the flush draw with two overs and a backdoor straight draw. The small blind checks, I check. The middle position player might have a strong hand. He bets 75. The situation escalates as the small blind raises all in for 175. It's kind of a weird spot. I'm uncomfortable cold calling the shove because then our hand would essentially be face up. I re-raise to 400 to isolate the small blind and perhaps get the middle position player to fold an over pair if that's what he's got. It'd be hard for the middle position player to call with only one pair regardless of what it is. I really don't want to see a shove though. After about 20 seconds, the initial preflop raiser folds, it's heads up with JR, we flip our hand over first figuring we could be behind, the turn is another 9, it's no help, at least it doesn't seem that way at first. Then the opponent shows 6-5 of spades, he flopped a flush that's no good, as well as a straight draw, plus any 6 or 5 will give him the win. The river's the queen of diamonds, neither of us improved, but our ace high is the best hand, we stack JR for the second time. I have mixed feelings about it, he's a nice guy, so I'd like to see him have a good session, but he doesn't offer me an additional free dinner for two after this hand, which is kind of bullshit. If I find myself in Savannah with a party of four and I'm looking for some Latin cuisine, I guess I'm going to have to go elsewhere. In hand 117, we straddle to 100, it folds to Doug, he has King Do suited, this is a combination that's a pure call for 50 more. He makes it, we look down and are happy to see Ace 10 suited, it's a monster in a blind versus blind spot. We raise to 300. Doug knows if there's a good chance I was going to raise, he calls with a suited King, we're heads up in position, the flop comes Ace King 6 rainbow, we both get a piece. Doug checks, this board is so good for my range and even my actual hand. Plus, I don't think that it's going to be too great for Doug's limp calling range, particularly since two of the aces are accounted for. I check back to give Doug a little rope if he wants to try and rep an ace on future streets in the event that he has no showdown value or very little. The turn is another ace. Doug has a hand with plenty of value and he doesn't need to turn it into a bluff. He checks. It's time to start getting money in. I still don't think there are too many hands Doug will have that can call a bet, especially now that he's checked twice and three of the aces are accounted for. I bet 100 to see if Doug wants to get wild. There's no need for him to, he just calls, there really isn't much out there, maybe Doug has a king or a six. The river is the four of spades, it's a blank, Doug checks, I played this in a very deceptive way up to this point, we're going to go way bigger than we did previously to target really any other pair or a non-believer. Brad's going to go for the 100 turn bet to the $700 river bet. Makes the call, the call. Paid. And... Honestly, Brad has played flawless poker tonight as far as the hands he's been in. Then run cold some more and add on for an additional 200. I'm in for 2200 total when I pick up ace 10 of hearts under the gun plus one. The European pro on my right raises to 30. I call, the button calls, the small blind is the main villain from this episode. He three bets at 230. This strikes me as odd since it's the first time that I've seen him three bet. He limp folded queens to a three bet earlier and he at least says that he limped in with kings before that. In that king's hand, the European player on my right raised, and the guy just flatted rather than limp 3-bet with the kings. He seems to really like to play a trappy style of poker. He's regularly doing the opposite of what people expect him to do with strong hands. And to his credit, it's worked out well for him. He might be the biggest winner at the table currently. He's won some big pots against some other players, and he's avoided paying me off when I've had some strong hands against him. Under the gun folds, I'm glad to have him out of the way. I have an ace, making it a lot less likely that the small blind 3-bet with ace is race king. Plus I know that he's folded a premium hand preflop already in a spot when he should have gotten it in against me. The small blind thinks that I don't bluff, and he's made folds every time that I've shown aggression. I try to play into his perception of me, and I put in a back 4-bet to 600. This is going to get the table's attention. It's not often that you see a back 4-bet, but it's usually done with ace is race king. I don't even remember a time that I've done this as a bluff. The conditions here just seem good to pull off the move. Occasionally, I actually will flat from under the gun plus one with aces or kings if the under the gun player is raised. Immediately three betting narrows down my range to only a couple of hands, so sometimes I prefer not to do that in order to avoid basically playing my cards face up. The button folds, it's on the small blind, he tanked for nearly two minutes in the hand when I had eight deuce offsuit, let's see if he can beat his own personal record here. About 50 seconds in, he asks for a count as he's done multiple times, I only have 855 behind. Folding to a 5-bet jam when I'm getting such a good price would really pain me, stuck me, might have to call if the opponent goes all in. Surprisingly, the small blind hasn't been anywhere as close to as talkative as he was in the previous hands. Aside from asking for a count, 
The only other thing that the player says a minute and 45 seconds into thinking is, uh, you don't have any beat, bro. and then after a full two minutes go by, he adds, the opponent has officially shattered his previous best tanking record. I'm just staring straight ahead. Two and a half minutes after I raised, the small blind finally folds. We get a pretty creative bluff through, and against someone who talks a lot of trash, it's important to show him that I owned his soul so that hopefully he'll play some more pots against me in the future. He's the primary person that I'd like to battle with. We have the game. I know you have me beat. I just, I just need to player would later say that he folded pocket 10s. That would have had me in pretty terrible shape if we got it all in. I win that one, but I'm still stuck 450. A half hour goes by before we're dealt ace 10 of hearts in the big blind. Some people are away from the table, so it's six handed. The hijack opens at 30. That's our boy Adam. The small blind calls. He's the one who doubled up through me with ace queen earlier. I check my watch. It's definitely time to get some revenge against him. We call for 20 more. The flop is an absolute dream. It comes king, queen, jack with two hearts. We flop the straight with a royal flush redraw. Small blind checks. I'm trying to contain my excitement. I check with hopes that the hijack has a piece of the board. That doesn't seem to be the case. He checks back. The turn is the eight of clubs. We still have the nuts. Small blind checks. I don't want to scare anyone. I don't want this to check through again either. I bet 30 to induce a light call or a raise. The hijack immediately folds. We might just win a small one. That's often the case when you have the world since other people tend not to have much. Hold that thought though, the small blind comes in out of nowhere with a check raise to 120. Remember in the vlog right before this one, I got check raised twice on the turn after check through on the flop, both times the opponent was bluffing. That could be what's going on here, especially since I bet so small, it could have looked like I was just taking a stab at it with second pair. Since I'm not worried at all about more hearts coming and I want to keep my opponent's bluffs in, I fly in order to set the trap. I've made four or five royal flushes in my life. Those were all before I started the YouTube channel. I actually haven't yet filmed a straight flush. I'd like that to change. The river is a heart. It's just the seven of hearts though. We've improved to a different hand that's still the nuts. Our opponent doesn't look to be slowing down either. He fires for 240. This isn't gonna save that price for long. 700. Nice. There's no snap fold. The small blind goes into the tank. He must actually have a strong hand like two pair or better. If that's the case, the heart on the river was a really bad card for me because I might have been able to make more money by raising the turn or if the river was a complete blank like the three of spades. The way the hand was played, it seems like I could have been on a heart draw, allowing the small blind to get away from whatever he has relatively cheaply. The story that I'm telling that I've got a monster is convincing mostly because it's true. The small blind just has to see it to believe it. He calls. We show him that we had the best hand the whole way. As a side note, if we didn't have two hearts, I would have raised a turn for sure to get as much money in at that point as possible in order to deny equity in case the opponent had hearts. We're getting right into it now. We pick up ace 10 suited in the cutoff, under the gun limps in, not a move recommended by many poker books. A player in middle position also limps in. I check my watch. It's indeed time to punish the limpers. We raised a 50. We'd love to play a bigger pot in position with what's likely to be the best hand. That won't be happening because the button calls behind us. He could have all kinds of hands like small or medium pocket pairs, suited connectors, or Broadway cards. Under the gun calls, middle position player calls. We're going four ways to the flop. It's 10-7-4 with two spades. We've got top pair, top kicker. Checks to me, this is a somewhat precarious spot. Top top isn't all that great when you have three other opponents. There aren't very many cards on future streets that I'll like that much. I bet 80, hoping to win this right now or at least get the button to fold. The button ruins the plan once again. He calls. This signifies quite a bit of strength given that two other players are left to act behind him. Under the gun folds, middle position player calls. We're down to three of us. I don't want to see a spade or any non-ace card above a five. No need to worry. The turn is miraculously the ace of hearts giving us top two pair. That helps ease my concerns. Middle position player checks. We're firing again, this time for 220. The button takes a play out of Elsa's book and he lets it go. The middle position player is more of a John Bon Jovi fan. And he's gonna hold on to what he's got. Sorry about that. Sometimes the commentary is best presented in song form. We're heads up. The river is the four of hearts. He pairs the board and the backdoor flush draw gets there. The opponent checks. I'm not sure how the opponent would make it this far with a four in his hand. It's also unlikely that I'd be up against a heart flush. I'm going for value. I bet 350 to target hands containing the ace of spades. Perhaps I can get a crying call if the player has a 10 as well. The opponent is thinking about it, so he must have a hand with at least some showdown value. I'm rooting for a call. 25 seconds go by before he eventually folds. After getting called in two spots on the flop, I'm happy with that run out and that result. 
Now we have ace-10 of diamonds in the small blind. It's a straddle pot. Middle position player limps in for 10. The hijack raises to 35. I call, the limper calls, we go three ways to the flop, and it comes jack 6-6 six, six with two diamonds. It's our fourth flush draw of the day. We haven't hit any of the previous ones. I check. Middle position player checks, the hijack bets 55. I'm gonna stick around, I call, middle position player folds, we're heads up with a pre-flop raiser. The turn is an ace, we make top pair to go along with our draw. I check, expecting it to check back a lot. If the opponent has something like kings, queens, king jack, queen jack, or jack 10. He doesn't check back, he bets 110. This is strange to me. He's either bluffing the flop with a hand like ace king and has me beat, or he's saying he has pocket aces, pocket jacks, a six, or ace jack. It's also possible he's completely bluffing and it kind of feels that way. I call, the river is the seven of hearts. We break another flush draw. I check, the hijack snap jams for 320. The fact that he didn't even take time to think about it makes me very suspicious. The issue is that I don't beat a single hand that he's betting for value. My kicker doesn't even play. I called a $200 river bet earlier and was wrong. I don't want to call and be wrong again. I'm on the fence. I'm looking for anything to sway me in either direction. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that the opponent is wearing a Santa hat. You can't trust a grown man wearing a Santa hat at the poker table. I make the call. Christmas come early for us. The hijack flips over 10 for of clubs for nothing at any point in the hand. He must have been after those Bradley dollars hard, and he got straight punished. I was put to the test, but I made the right decision for a big pot. We're all the way out of the hole, and we're actually up 210. 